<laughs> Welcome to Biff's Mystery Theater. I have many tales to tell you. Ghost stories, murder stories, and tales that will make your bones chill. <laughs> Join me, won't you? For theater of the mind, where you always have the best seat in the house. <laughs> Now close your eyes and turn off the lights. <laughs> Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Hyman with another true story of crime. Listen. The sound you hear is that of a swimmer in the Adriatic Sea. Her name is Agrippina. And the stroke she's using, uh, tis one of the day. According to research, a kind of combination overhand side and flutter kick. Agrippina is quite good at it, too. She being the mother of the Emperor of Rome and having the best instructors in all things. For instance, her swimming instructor told her to roll over on her back and float when she got tired, which she just did. And she was tired, all right. She'd been swimming toward shore for the last two hours. Not for laurels, not for prizes, but to save her life. It seems her son had tried to drown her by rigging up a boat whose bottom would fall out, and which did when Agrippina was on it. Sonny's name? Nero. So tonight, my report to you about a mother and son in Rome in the first century A.D., listed in my files as your loving son, Nero. Crime Classics. A new series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. In the year 62 A.D., Nero had been on the throne for eight years and had put on 60 pounds. And no wonder. At 25, he had tasted every sweet from Ethiopia to Britannia and had scouts out for whatever he had missed. I'd better tell you some nice things about Nero before we really get into this. First of all, he had a genuine love for Rome and its people. Oftentimes, Nero would release a thousand birds of every kind, some with Roman money attached to them. He also threw to the people pork and mutton saddles, as well as tickets for grain and togas, and choice seats to concerts, at which he sang. This was the Nero that history forgot. Now, let's have a look at the Nero who is remembered. Scene, dressing room in the Roman Colosseum. Principles, Nero and Seneca, his mentor. Hold high the shield for me, Seneca, so that I may look into it. You look like... What? Out with it. Out with it, Seneca. Like a beast of the Nubian plains. Which was my design when I put on the skin of a black leopard. I meant sleek. And you meant handsome? And dangerous. <laughs> Do I frighten you? Yes. With a coward. Oh, Nero. <laughs> <laughs> the emperor will have great sport today. The crowd will love this novelty. I am beloved, is that not so? The poets sing of it. But listen now, great Nero, I have a thing to speak of. Uh, hand me that broadsword. Here. Ah. Ah. This sword will be my cause in the arena this day. Uh, beloved Nero. Seneca? This thing I have to speak of. Yes. They say... Who? Oh. Those about you of importance. They say you grow overly fond of your mother. As I am her son, why not? That she saps you of your wisdom, 
that she does undue influence upon you. Agrippina's a loving mother. Just so. Too much so. Her mother love saps you of your vigor. What you say is an impiety, Seneca. Lord Nero, be careful of your sword. What more of my mother and me? I repeat only what they say. <laughs> Come, Seneca, lift me into the cage. Yes. Bend down your back so that I can step on it. Yes. Ah. Be brave now, Seneca. I am in a cage. What else is that your brain as concerns my mother? Kill her. For your sake? Because I love her more than you? For the sake of Rome. Which is me. Of course. Have the slaves wheel me into the arena, Seneca. Yes. What happened when Nero was rolled into the arena in a cage dressed in a black leopard skin is a fine clue as to the lad's personality. Also in the arena and tied securely to stakes were slaves. Then the cage was sprung open, Nero leaped out with his broadsword and performed whatever ritual came to mind. Later, when the sands of the arena were swept clean and in some places re-sanded, Nero performed again. This time with stringed lyre in curlets and silken toga. When Nero sweetly strikes his lyre, Apollo strings his bow, and Nero's song is the tongue of fire, while the goddess moon swings low. Oh, Nero is the prince beloved, and Nero is a and so on into the night. He didn't sing well, but he sang loud and long, and he had a special arrangement with the Colosseum guards. Collect the heads of all those who tried to leave while he was singing. It was usually after midnight when Nero finally gave the signal for his audience to go home. Nero was fatigued, and he wanted his mother. History tells us Agrippina had a restorative influence on her son because of the soothing quality of her voice, perhaps of her understanding of the light in her motherly eyes, or just perhaps because of a way she had with rose oil and myrrh. <sighs> Mother. Hush, son. How tired you must be from the day. Let me this soothing of you. Mother. Turn your other shoulder to me, son. So help me, Jupiter, Mother. If you don't let me ask you what is... Yes, what is it? What I did today in the arena with the wearing of the leopard skin. What of it, Mother? Terrifying. Huh? What That's else? Exciting. Yes. Yeah. And what else? Papilla sat beside me. She bit the soft of her hand till blood came in such ecstasy. <laughs> oh, she... Mother, Papilla's always biting the soft of her hand when she sees me. <laughs> She's fond of you. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> Last night, Papilla painted her face in ochre and went to the oracle. <laughs> She's afraid Acte, the slave girl from Germania, has taken a place in my affection. <laughs> has she? Acte opened her veins this noon because I demanded it, and Papilla doesn't know it yet. <laughs> I know it might have, Mother. Well, not that much. Papier is waiting for you, isn't he? Oh, of course she is. What does she say of me? We hardly talk, Mother. I sing to her, and then we stare at each other. Ah, oh, thank Jupiter for Eros. But Seneca talks to you, doesn't he? Hand me that garland, Mother. Doesn't he? No, much. Constantly, pratingly, ceaselessly, without end. Of me? Much. Constantly, pratingly, ceaselessly without it. What does he say? He wants me to kill you. I see. He says you love me too much and have undue influence upon me, therefore you should be dead. Nero, my son. Yes, mother. Remember that Claudius died suddenly, and for that reason you are emperor. Remember that Claudius died because I wished it. Somehow there was poison, and somehow Claudius died. 
And remember, too, that rightfully your stepbrother Britannica should sit on the Emperor's throne. And remember... Jupiter, look at the hourglass. The sand's run out. I'm late. Let me kiss you. Mm. Mm. Ave Mater. The poppy blossom of slender shaft Of scarlet petal her gaze enthralled Give thanks to Olympus Give thanks to the gods that season Nero has to her call. <laughs> Emperor. Wait. Hmm. I... <laughs> uh, I lay on the lotion today after the pool. And I gazed up at the heavens, and the thoughts went through me in a rush. Mm, millions of thoughts, and... Bad boy. <sighs> After tonight, says tomorrow. The being emperor again. And the whisperings and the intrigues. Ah, oh, Papilla, my head swims in thoughts. My poor, 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 poor head. Rested upon me. <sighs> <sighs> emperor? Yes, your mother anointed well. Your curlets smell of the dew. <laughs> she hates you, Papilla. I know. She hates Seneca. Because he is wise. <laughs> Papilla. Does not your garland bind your brow? Here, let me take it off. Oh. Ah, gentle Papilla. <laughs> Seneca is wise, Nero. Do you want my mother dead, too? Only for your sake. Huh? It is said that Agrippina is anointing her stepson, Britannicus, lately. And in private calls him Emperor. Hmm. All night a Rubicus dwells a witch. Pluto's daughter, Ilgot, is she. Her name is Locusta, 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 horrible witch. From the river of the dead, her... Poisons be... Oh, sing no more, Nero. <laughs> I love thee too well, Emperor. Papia wasn't the only one who bade him lay down his lyre and steal his song. A man named Petronius did the same thing. He wrote Nero a note and told the emperor that he was the worst singer of all time. Then Petronius, to save a lot of time all the way around, opened his veins. But Papia, being currently Nero's type of love, she got away with it. Also, in Nero's ear, she went on and on about the new Delphic oracle, who knew the mystery she said like no other oracle in Rome or in the provinces. A younger man, she told Nero, one with younger ideas. One who could conjure voices, speak to the gods, and recognize ancestors in various animals. And very good with the advice. So, Nero kissed her for her concern. <laughs> Retrieved his garland, left her. On the way to the Delphic Oracle, he made a decision. And I'll do it now, as long as I've got my mind made up. And he made a detour stopped in to see Locusta on the Iter Rubicus, then paid a call on his stepbrother, Britannicus. This vase of wine I bring you, brother, from Gaul, it is, where the Rhone flows gently and the grapes grow fat. O oh, great stepbrother, whose love is dear to me and who desires nothing but good for me, for these reasons I give you this wine that you should drink. <laughs> drink it! Like that, boy. Throw back your throat and let the coolness of it... Death of it touch you and chill you. <laughs> come on, come on. Britannicus has drunk poison and is dead. He hated life and wanted no more of it. Then Nero called upon the Delphic Oracle. 
No sooner had the oracle lighted his pot of fire and said the words than Nero asked the question. My brother Britannicus is dead. What should be of my mother? Jupiter and those on Olympus are jealous of you, O Caesar Nero. They would smile more brightly upon you if Agrippina were dead and belonged to them. Nero went home to the palace, and the oracle went into his back room. It is done, Seneca, I have told him. And he will kill his mother? This I believe. How shrewd is Popea to have sent him to you? This I believe. On the table is a thousand sesterces, oracle. I will say words for you into the fire, Seneca. Hail. Hail. Nero went to sleep that night with a new mission in life. He was going to kill his mother. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. Don't walk a mile, just sit at your radio for hilarious entertainment Monday nights on CBS Radio's Walk a Mile Quiz. Bill Cullen's in charge of the game with a high-paying jackpot in prizes and pleasure. Later tonight, don't miss Walk a Mile. And say, also later this evening on most of these same stations, listen for Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts with Arthur himself back in the saddle again. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on... Your loving son, Nero. A word about Rome. In the year 62 A.D., Rome was in her glory. Her subject people stretched from Asia Minor to Britain, and they paid their taxes on time. A city of slaves and temples and chariot races and visitors from Greece and freedmen from the provinces and spices and oils and unguents. And here and there on the streets, an old Etruscan. The Colosseum was the center of attraction. Here, man fought man, beast fought beast. And on holidays... They switched. Nero was emperor, and you already know how Nero loved to set an example. Agrippina was his mother, and some background on her. Out of a maternal concern for her son, she poisoned a lot of people, most prominent of whom, her third husband, the emperor Claudius. Pliny the Elder, in his letters, mentions her as the vilest of women, and I just quoted. Uh, but Pliny was called in the journals of Tacitus as a sour man, and I just quote it again. Anyhow, her son Nero woke up one morning determined to murder her. So he sent for Locusta of the Ita Rubicus. Get off the floor, witch, and come close. Uh, you brought poisons. Uh, I also. Uh, what's this one for? <laughs> Nephews. Hmm. Uh, and this? Daughters. And this? Mothers. Mothers? Oh, tell me of it. It is powdered stuff of a thing I know, plucked from a swamp I know, when one night the moon of fertility rode. <laughs> In the eighth month of Octavian, when there was harvest, <laughs> it kills mothers quickly, instantly. Uh, without pain. I, I would not like my mother to suffer. Like that. Oh. <laughs> How is it used? Yes, a drop in a sweet meat <laughs> or whatever. I'll have it. Uh, oh, Seneca! Uh, pay her, Seneca. A thousand sesterces. Seneca, have the wall splashed with sweet-smelling oil to take this reek out. Go, go. <laughs> And so, Mother, is a small gift of the day in honor of Persephone, sweetmeats from Thebes. Plump dates rolled in cinnamon, stiffened honey from Alexandria, wild berries from the south slope of Lebanon drowned in sweet essences. 
Which is your favorite, son? Oh, this one, this one. Put it to my lips. First. Yes? I would kiss you, Mother. The Stephanie's day is a favorite of mine. You'll make it happier. <laughs> Bend to me. Hmm. <laughs> 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 now here is your walnut sweet. Mm. It's very good. Excellent. Mm. May I have another? Of course, of course. Here's a choice one. It's bigger. Mm. Now, bro, you... The God should know of it. And may I have some of that? What is it? Oh, morsel from the Hebrews. A cluster of almonds chopped with apples and dipped in wine. Mm, delicious. Uh, 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 mother. Mm, what? How do you feel? Blessed by Jupiter who's given me such a fond son. Son. Yes, Mother. Eat of your gift. Here, I will place a sweet meat uh, to your lips. Uh, no, stop. Stop it. Do you ail? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. You ail. Let me <laughs> hold you, son. Sweet son. Emperor's son. I have here a translation from a Latin historian named Suetonius. In essence, here's what the gentleman has to say. Thrice, Nero tried to poison his mother with sweetmeats and other devices, but each time, warned of his plan, she suffered herself to swallow antidotes beforehand. Nero then planned another method for his mother's destruction. He tampered with the ceiling of her bedroom, contriving a mechanical device for loosening its panels and dropping them upon her while she slept. But... This leaked out through some of those connected with the plot, so that Agrippina was warned and slept elsewhere. Imagine Nero's chagrin and fury and petulance. So his mentor, Seneca, came up with a thought. Now, now, the first thing you've got to do is control yourself. Throw that last Grecian urn and get it out of your system. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you did. It was a hideous bit of pottery anyway. Now the thought. Write your mother a letter. To say what? Well, you wrote Petronius a letter telling him it would be best for himself and the state to open his veins, did you not? Yes. And he did it. As did Fluvius when you wrote him a letter. And Casper. And, and Marius and his three sons and that uh, senator. Lucius. Loud from his mouth of taxes and excesses. And others. Write her. And you will tell me what to say? As before, with the others. Let us do it. <laughs> And since, Mother, it appears you are trying to have me slain, for the good of all of us and of the state, I, Nero, Emperor, and faithful... You're going too fast. Where are you? Uh, I, Nero. Emperor and faithful son do request your death. This gift I enclose, small knife of gold, for slitting. And sign it, your loving son, Nero. Now put your seal to it, and I'll have a slave take it over right away. The slave has just now brought me your letter, which needs prompt reply. I will not kill myself, are they? <laughs> Mother? Uh, mother? Ah. <laughs> oh, Mother. What is it? Did you enjoy the banquet? You sang beautifully. That is not what I mean, Mother. What then? No one fell dead at the banquet, Mother. Neither your taste nor mine. I don't want to think about it. I know that. That's why I've arranged this voyage for you. And when you return from Thessaly, you will bring back forgiveness in your heart for me. Son. Yes. 
Do you still want your mother dead? No. Swear it? By the gods of Olympus. Then my voyage will be joyful. With a new and fleet ship to take you to Golden Sands and return refreshed. I love you well, Nero. You are my love, mother. Ave. Ave. Sail home to me soon. If this tender scene of Aves and loving kindnesses perplexes you, well, it really shouldn't. Nero was still up to no good. In spite of the sumptuous banquet he had arranged for his mother out of the clear blue sky, and in spite of the trip he had arranged for her to Golden Sands and return by way of a peace offering, Nero still had murder on his mind. This ship he had built for his mother, you know who built it? Anisetus. And who is Anisetus? Any of your better histories on triremes and other Roman naval craft will devote at least a few paragraphs to Anisetus. He was forever trying things against the laws of navigation. For instance, this ship that would take Agrippina to Thessaly, he designed it so its bottom would fall out five miles at sea. And did it? Well, let's pick up the ship just before it was five miles out on the Adriatic. Quiet ocean. Azure skies. As fine a two decks of slaves chained to the oars as you'll ever find. And Agrippina having grapes at the captain's table. You men of the sea, Captain. All my life, the great wonder I've had about them. What's that? Captain! Well, everybody drowned except Agrippina. Not that she was the greatest swimmer in the world, as she only knew one stroke, but she had sense enough to roll over on her back and float when she got tired. So she got to shore. She made known who she was, which got her a fresh toga and transportation back to the palace. Nero was waiting for her. Mother. 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 Oh, mother! <laughs> Slaves! Strangle her! And they did, with a silken scarf. It is interesting to note that the word mater in Latin means mother. From mater, we get the word matricide. <laughs> In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classics. Your loving son, Nero, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland, with another true story of crime. Listen. <laughs> the lady's name is Maria. And she's just come home from a party, dressed to kill. She's come home to discover a robber. <laughs> the famous John Shepard, who removes Maria's lavalier, <laughs> gently, her earrings, <laughs> slowly, and her rings. <laughs> she was face to face with John Shepard, and for the rest of her life, she'd have something to talk about. Tonight, my report to you on... The Incredible History of John Shepard. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now once again, Mr. Thomas Highland.
The English king who was on the throne in 1722 was remarkable in that he could speak no English. Not that he was an idiot. He was a German, and he could speak German very well. As a matter of fact, he'd brought two young and ravishing ladies from Germany with him so that he could have someone to talk with, lonely monarch that he was. His name was George Louis, and his reign was stormy with that trouble with the Jacobites. This unpleasantness, you will recall, was settled by the Duke of Argyle, a soldier and dandy, husband to Anne the Knitter. And into these times strode John Shepherd. Well, he didn't stride exactly. He usually sneaked in through the back window, and so as to rob. And one night in April, he got caught. Light the taper in the candlestick, Maria, and we'll see who we have here. And you, sir, don't move, or surely this blunderbuss I'm holding will... I shall will... not move. Husband? Hold the candlestick up to him, and we'll see. Oh! Ooh. Who you have here, madam, is John Shepherd. <gasps> John Shepherd be you. Well now, well now, sir, you're caught. No more sneaking in and robbing for you, sir. And no more wives of respectable husbands will you make play with. John Shepherd. Come away from him, Marie. He's only a boy. Marie. Downy cheek youth. Come to rob. No. Huh. I shall tell you why I've come here. Do. I had heard it spoken about, madam, of you. Of me. Maria, come away. Stand aside. Gently, gently, husband. And you were saying what, John? And I sought you out. Unbeknownst to you, I have sought you out and have followed you. Once in a crowded place, I touched gently like this. Hmm. And this thrilled you. So you've come here to rob us out of house and home? No, to find milady's boudoir. Now you can talk as much as you wish, youth. For as soon as you are done with the talk, this trigger gets pulled. And from Cheapside to the Thames, London husbands all about will raise a hurrah in my name. Boudoir, John. To drown myself in the scent of yourself you have left behind. Husband. Yes? Come over here a moment. Look at the candlestick, husband. What of it? Oh. Now, you were saying, John... Beautiful. Gossamer hair. And lips of... Coral buds. Mm, lips. <sighs> but soft as soft can ever be. If you're to go, go quickly. And the jewels sparkle at your throat. And when you move your hand, it makes a pattern of glitter on the gentle air. Take them. Yes. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> Lady Wedline says, about you, she says. Did she? Now, hush. Yes. On this night, he was barely 20. His father died from drink when he was three, and he was left orphaned when his mother died a year later. When he was 10, his aunt hired him out to a cane chair maker. But the trade bored him, and he ran away. Alone in London, he began to pursue the libertine life, and was soon adept at picking pockets, mugging, breaking into houses, bribing policemen, and joshing the ladies. He was a handsome boy, and even at 16 was caught up in a scandal involving Madame Scott's school, causing it to lose its charter for three decades. And once, at 19, according to a footnote, his activities all but caused Admiral Brisbane to bring the fleet in from Skagerrak, to scotch a rumor. Romantic, dashing, and bold. But he had his home life, too. Scallion, neat, billaging. Uh, now, Beth. Pretty boy, where have you been, pretty boy? You know well. Would I mouth the question if I knew it well? Where have you been? Uh, uh, about? Stealing. Well, of course, stealing. Then show me. Show me why I've been waiting to the wee hours. Nothing to show you, Beth. Oh? Uh, on coming home to you, I met a man. And he said, what you got to sell, John boy? What you got to sell? Oh? Just some baubles. And he cheated you for what they were worth and you gambled and now you got nothing. Uh, I saved you uh, something, dear Beth. Uh, what? Here's a bauble for you. A piece of glass you bought at a store for half a mite. Here, let me put it to your lowly throat. No. Beth, pretty... 
Richie Kim. A thing to tell you, John, cos I've sworn it to me. Beth Lyon, I swore to me. Any more talking amongst the maids in the market I hear? Any more soft laughing I hear in John Shepherd's name with it to the police I'll go to? I swore oh. it. I swore it. Cos I'm tired of waiting into the wee hours for you and you coming home and tired and cheated, gambled out. Now I want none of you no more, John. You come to me and you'll change your mind, Beth Lyon. All right. We'll see. Now what, John Shepherd? Soft touches your hair against my cheek. And a sparkle go. (laughs) Get out of here. Beth. What? You said a thing about the police. Get out of here. The cell's not especially clean, John Laddie, but it's never been broke out of. A bite of you. Wife. Woman. There's a new one in the little cell. Spoon a pot of gruel and take it into him. And not so generous, neither. There's only a mite to feed them each day, and most of them will hang anyhow. So why fat the likes of them? That's enough, now that's enough. You take it, time. Hello? Oh. Hello? Oh, what dream is this? What angel is this that brings me sustenance? Here, I'll take it from your softling hands. Why stare at me with soft doe eyes? I'm but John Shepherd. And why widen go your eyes? You cannot know me, for I am nothing. And this is a dream anyhow, and does not happen in reality. And how am I sure of it? For no cheek was so rosy and warm beneath my lips. And if those dainty hands were to hold a key now... (laughs) Yes, just so. Oh, dream, wake me not. But let the loving fingers turn key in lock while lip presses lip. (sighs) Madam, no, speak not. But walk with me, and show which way. How do I get to the street, madam? Without even paying a fine. As a matter of fact, there is on permanent exhibition at Scotland Yard a locket which the warden's wife gave to John Shepherd as a memento of their walk from cell to street. A simple, small locket with a simple, small diamond in the center of it. It is said that John Shepherd cherished the locket for a week before he sold it to a pawnbroker. And so he was on the loose again, stealing, robbing, chucking chins, steering clear of Beth Lyon and the police, gambling and doing all the things which made him a legend. And one day, it was a summer's day, and he was strolling in the fabulous Chesney Lane and eyeing the nice things behind the shop windows. And he stopped for a moment and considered a diamond brooch and wondered where the closest rock was when... Don't do it, John. Don't do it, lad. Huh? I know what you're thinking, John. How to get a rock? To hand to smash a window, to steal what you see there. Why you got your hand on my shoulder? Because I'm of the Lord, John, lad. And I'm arrested then? You be John Shepherd, ain't you? Am I arrested then? We was told to look out for you, especially here in Chesney Lane. Ah, ah don't you run, John, lad. Then what you want from me? I've uh, heard you're a sly one. 
And a nervy one, too. Yeah, there's a thing on your mind you're not saying. Aye. Which is what? It's my duty to walk up and down Chesney Lane and to keep the law and to take note of things. And you've noted... Down what? there, across the street, two blocks down, at the corner... The Greystone House? Aye. The house of Lord Courtliffe and his lady? Aye. What of it? It is empty. Uh, of the uh, Lord and the lady, that is. The servants? Gone. All of them gone to watering. In Brighton. Dee Dee now. Dee Dee. As I am the Lord, Dee Dee. As my name is Cooper, Dee Dee. Let us walk. Ah, Dee Dee. Later that day, an advertisement was inserted in the London Times that the furniture and belongings of Lord and Lady Courtliffe were on sale on the premises in their natural surroundings. The house was thrown open to the public, and it was a marvelous sale. The floor walker's name was John Shepherd. He also took the money. You are listening to Crime Classics, and your host, Thomas Highland. You don't have to tell the average or above-average housewife that radios work before dark, too. Chances are she's already familiar with the daytime dramatic serials on CBS radio, a succession of fine day-to-day -day stories about people it's easy to like and be interested in. Every weekday on most of these same stations, listen where America listens most, for Aunt Jenny, Ma Perkins, Rosemary... Our Gal Sunday, and all our Stars Address daytime serials. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics. And his report to you on the incredible history of John Shepard. I would like to speak to you briefly about Nougat Prison. And Nougat Prison because, as you must know, John Shepard must eventually come here. Since, as all of us know too, Lex Omnia Vincit. Well, Nougat Prison was built in the 12th century and was originally the gatehouse to the west side of London. As a gatehouse, many gay times were had here, travelers being what they are. But in the 15th century, iron bars were imported from Sheffield. And as a prison, Nugget came into its own. The Great Fire of 1666 destroyed it, but from the ashes rose a dungeon even more formidable than its predecessor. In 1723, the year which concerns us here, Nugget was a place of dampness and stone and iron, with a special section for shackle and rack. You might be interested in knowing that the most popular method of execution in this era was pressing a fellow to death. More later. In the meanwhile, back to Chesney Lane and the house of Lord and Lady Courtliffe, toward the end of a highly successful sale in which the Greystone house was being stripped to its stone. I beg your pardon. Yes? Are the tapestries for sale, too? Oh, yes. And at what price? Uh, which tapestry did you have in mind? Well, let me see. This one. Ah, excellent choice. I like unicorns. <laughs> Ten pounds. You'll give me a bill of sale? Uh, why should I? To prove that I have come by this honestly. After all... After all what? This is a famous tapestry. Dee Dee. The Farandole of the Unicorns. Oh, Dee Dee. Lord Courtliffe's favorite. I know, he told me. As he told me. A good friend of his? He has many friends. In the police. And... You're... Captain Cleaver. I'm... John a... Shepard. Only John Shepard would have the imagination, the audacity to open up a stranger's house and sell all the stranger's belongings. Uh, Captain. Yes, lad. There's an arrangement I have with uh, an officer, Cooper, of the police. Pity. Why pity? 
Now, Officer Cooper will hang, be hung, too. Oh. Then, uh, of it, there's no doubt. You're on... Wait. What? Uh, the proceeds from the sale of the furnishings on the second floor. What of them, lad? <laughs> Yours. My name is not Cooper. Come along, lad, John, lad. You're under arrest. I'll test that stone, Mason. <coughs> Tight. Good. You're a staple to the stone floor right enough, John Lad. You'll not get out of here. Now, Stone Mason, for an extra safety, a U spike about his neck onto the floor. Huh? Now let me see. Uh, uh, a couple more hits, Stone Mason. A couple more, my man. The only time you'll be leaving Newgate, lad, John Lad, is when they trundle your body out. And we'll take another extra safety. Uh, hand me those chains, Stone Mason. Wrap them round you, lad, John Lad. Goodbye, lad. Come, Sir Mason. I have here a newspaper of the time from which I'd like to read a paragraph or two. John Shepard, alone in the stone room of Newgate Prison, espied a crooked nail. With this device, he unburdened himself of his chains. Some have said that John Shepard enlisted outside aid in loosening himself from the stapling. But John Shepard has claimed that this is not so. But it remains true that unstaple he became. Whereupon, he removed two stones from the wall of the room which gave him access to a passageway between the walls. Thus, he climbed to the Red Room, so-called for obvious and horrible reasons. He threw down the door of this unspeakable closet and thence came to the chapel. Removing a spike from the door of the chapel, he experienced small difficulty in opening four other doors, which led him to the roof. It was a rainy night, and he almost, in traversing this place, slipped to his doom. However, he jumped across a narrow alleyway onto the roof of a Mr. Finchley who lived next door and opened a window casement of this house. Don't be frightened. Where did you come from? From out there, from the rain. Oh. You have no need to be frightened. Well, who are you? John Shepherd. True. Such is my misfortune. Misfortune? Yes. How? I say my name and... I am shunned by all. My father... Don't is... scream for him. Just let me walk through that door and out of here. My father... I know, a wrathful man. My and father he... is in the country. I know, in the next room. In the country. You... What? In the country. I've been trying to tell you. Oh. What wicked man is he to leave you here all alone? To leave you at the mercy of whoever comes across your roof... And into your window. Oh, he needed to go. A, a matter of his health. <sighs> what is your name? Angela. I knew it. And I dared not speak it. Angela. Of angels. Oh, John. Yes? Your clothes. They're wet and, and you... Oh, cold. <laughs> Shivery. In the next room, there's a fire. <laughs> take me to it. Oh, take my hand, John. <sighs> Of angels. Take me to it. And in no time at all, John Shepherd had the run of the house. He particularly liked the library and would spend hours here. He liked to read to Angela. And as your almanac will show you, this was a very rainy summer. 
So he read to her a lot. And in spite of the inclement weather, it was truly an idyllic summer for these two young people. I love you, Angela. Oh, and I love you, John. John, oh, John. John. And small lovers spat. I hate you! Hate me, do you? Well, I despise you. Partings. <laughs> Greetings. Hmm. Oh, John, oh, John, John. You've come back. And John would read to her again. And sometimes next door there would be an execution. And they would watch. And every week, Angela wrote to her daddy. Dear Papa, it rains here. Most every day it rains. And there is chill in the air. I thank the stars each night that you're in the country and getting your strength back again. Stay as long as you want, and I will come down and visit you at Christmas time. As you have told me to, I improve myself in the library, reading and doing sums and musing. Tonight there is a thunder shower. How fortunate are you that you are not here. John, I'm writing to my father. Hurry then. Your loving daughter, Angela. In the autumn, the weather got better. And one morning in early October, right outside Angela's house, when John was returning from the greengrocer's, a voice from out of the past all but dropped John like a pulled steer. John, John, well, John Shepherd. Hello, John. <laughs> Hello, Beth. Ain't they hanged you yet, John? Oppressed you? I'm a hurry, Beth. Be you, be you now. Please! Yes, hush. Now, why should I, John? Because uh, um, we're old friends, Beth. Be we now. <laughs> John? Uh, yes? Were the police to find you, my lad, what would happen to you? Well, um... They'd hang you, wouldn't they? A pressure thinner than a comedy cake. But you won't call them, now, would you? I might. Unless what? Like it was in the old times. Like it was before... John! Well, now. Well, now. Do you have the parsnips from the greengrocers? Do you have the parsnips from the greengrocers? Well, now. Who's this woman, yeah, John? It's my, uh, my, it's my... Forgot old, my uh, name, oh. John. I'm Beth Lyon, and who be you, little doc? Come into the house, John. Come into the house, John. Pretty as you please. Well, John ain't coming into your house no more. Are you, John? Angela. Yes, John? Uh, Angela. Uh, now, Angela. you listen to me. You listen to me, John. I know where you came from that night. That first night when you came in from the roof, out of the rain. You came from next door, from Newgate Prison. Uh, Angela. Uh, and if you don't come into the house this moment, I'll yell for the police. And he comes with me, a uh, royal John? Police! And when John moved toward Angela, you guessed it. Police! Well, as you can imagine, that brought the police. And John was arrested again and got his old room back again. He was stapled again and chained again. And the guard was placed on 24-hour vigil. Hi. Hey, guard! Guard! Yeah. How would you like to... Uh... Oh. And so he was brought to trial and found guilty of robbery and footpadism, and, as was the law of the time, sentenced to execution. Since this was the very autumn when pressing to death went out of fashion, John Shepherd was hanged. This last event took place on the 16th of November, 1724, in front of a mob made up chiefly of protesting but fascinated women, an estimated 200,000 in the audience. There were on record certain excerpts, statements from certain women who had known him. 
He's so young and gentle. They need not hang him. Oh, poor lad, it'll be a terrible loss. London will seem different without the like Sir John Shepherd. There'll be no one to love for no more. Each time it rains, I'll keep looking at the window and remembering. Oh, sweet apparition, and he'll no longer appear. Sweet John Shepherd, cruel John Shepherd, I scarce know whether I love you or hate you the more. Scarce knew whether she loved or hated him the more. Which was about the consensus, from a goodly sampling. And just think, only 23 years old. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. John Shepard, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was adapted from themes of the period and conducted by Bernard Herman. And the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. <laughs> a maiden's laughter. A maid of India with bells on her feet that jingle when she runs. She's having a lovely time. The picnic's been a great success. And now her husband's chasing her through the tall grass. Here he comes. <laughs> For an older man, he's got a pretty good stride. And before she knew it, he had his wife circling around an almond tree. Caught her. <laughs> <sighs> then the thing that ruined the picnic for everybody. <clears throat> Jealousy lurking nearby with a sledgehammer. Tonight, my report to you on Old Six Toes. How he stopped construction on the BBC and I. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, teller of murders. Now once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. In 1880, the Great Sepoy Rebellion was already just a memory, and those who had lived through the hundred days of Lance and Torch and British Square had settled back with a tight little smile, waiting. Queen Victoria had been proclaimed Empress, and Lord Dundridge was saddling his first pony in the cool gardens outside Bombay. And to the west and south, Concan Province was welcoming spring. The soft winds up from the Gulf were cooling, and set asway the temple bells. Of other bells, however, those small ones held to the ankles of Boggy with golden wires, she set them asway herself. She seemed to always be running, from this task to that, from this person to that, on this mission or that. And one day, she was noticed, and admired, and bargained for. I have seen her, and am told you are her father, as I am. Has she been spoken for? Many times. The young men of the village all... The young men. They have youth. What have you? What I gave my youth for. Wealth. And what would you give for my daughter, Bahi? Two goats. Two bullocks and a field to till. My daughter dances lightly to whatever music may be. If I give you this, then I shall be poor. If you be poor, then work. My daughter will wait home for you to kiss away the pain of toil. My daughter is slender as the reeds on the river and as pliant. My daughter's voice is as the lute and her hands are wings. Enough. 
Enough. Then it is done. Done. Foggy! Foggy! Come! Baggy, bow to your husband. Now, greet him. I have waited long, my lord. Command me. Command her, he did. To dip three times in scented water, which was the custom, for they were to be wed this night. To bind her hair in the manner prescribed, to spend the appointed hour with her mother, the appointed hour with her father, and thus, anointed with fragrant oils and wisdom, to come to him in the place of marriage. And the vows were taken, and they were wed, and went to the hut of the newly married of the village, and removed their shoes before entering. Beloved. Yes. You have six toes. Since birth. A good omen, husband. Baki, beloved. Yes. Draw closer. Your command. Oh, husband. First, a thing. What? In the village I come from, far to the north, a ritual which guaranteed identity. I do not understand. Identity, beloved. In case you forget... Who you belong to. But... Therefore, these I show you, beloved. Oka, Sienna, Vermilion, and a needle. For what reason? The tattooing of you. Please, please do not... I command it. Be still! Yes. You may ask why I, Sonu, formerly of wealth and station, now hold spikes so that they may be driven by you into the ties which hold the rails. You may ask why I, Sonu, formerly of wealth, am now but an employee of the Bombay, Bengal, Calcutta, and Indian Railroad. You may wonder these things, and I will tell you. I have traded wealth for greater wealth. The lands which I had and the animals, these I bartered for a bride. And such a bride, a child of 18 summers who is called Baki. Friend, friend on do, muscular youth, wielder of the great hammer while I hold, come home with me, and I will show her to you. Will you come home with me? Yes. Well, uh, of course he wants more wine. Fill high his cup. Have I not said it, Don Do, this treasure? Truly. Sir. Yes? And what do you do on the railroad? Well, Marvelous uh, things. With his hammer, all day long he drives deep the spikes. More spikes and deeper than anyone else. Oh. Poor. High my cup again. Weary, weary and toil. This is wine will soothe, husband. Drink. Yeah. Good wife. Good friends. Sir. Yes? The arms of yours could lift him as if he were a child and place him upon his bed. Yes. His bed is here. Sleep well, honored husband, toiler, bringer of bread to this happy house. Baggy. I know. Let us walk to where the night will wash over us. I want to. Come, then. Do you love me? 
with all the might and passion that is the strength of me. My husband has six toes. It is written that this is a good omen. A man with six toes is said to be blessed. In this way, he has brought you to me. Terry here. They tarried, and the moon swung over from where it was and became for that brief time their moon, as did all the marvelous things of the night. And Boggy forgot all the vows she made to Sonu and made new vows to Dondu. Forever, always, always and forever. And Dondu made promises to her. Tomorrow night, when the old man is asleep. Here, forever, always. Always and forever. Which goes to prove, I suppose, that railroading men have a certain fascination all over the world. And Dondu of the BBC and I was certainly one who gave rise to the legend. Baggy. Forever. There is a thing. Listen to what I say. Yes? This is wrong. What is? You are bride to an old man. What evil bird hammers at your brain where conscience is so that you say our love is wrong? Did you not hear it? You are bride to this old man. Then you want done with our love? No. Then what? If you were widow... If I were widow... We would not sneak about as children who do evil tricks. True. Think of it, then. If you were widow... Don't do? Yes, I want to be. And so you shall. So you shall. And when they reached the village on the edge of it where they said goodbye, they were startled for a moment. Suddenly it was morning. And they looked and they saw. The sky was blood red. listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Thirty-five years ago this week, a few hundred AEF delegates in Paris founded the American Legion. Today, in 17,200 posts, there are nearly three million legionnaires. Service to the community, state, and nation. Service to veterans and their families. These have grown to be hallmarks of American Legion activity, without which the nation and its people would be great losers. Happy 35th birthday, American Legion. Keep up your great work and continue to grow. Now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on Old Six Toes, how he stopped construction on the BBC and I. Each country has and is proud of its own history of railroading. It may come as a surprise to some that laying track in India has a lore unparalleled in railroading annals. To give you a hint, there's a saying out of Bombay that never did the tigers eat so good as when the BBC and I put down a steel through South Concan, the place that concerns us here tonight. Consider the feat, if you will. 116 miles of rail through jungle, swamp, and wasteland. A body died there for every cross tie. 116 miles of rail plunging progress from Taj Pahor to the sea. And, two-thirds of the way, the living legend of a man, Nandu. And at his feet, holding the spikes, 
An old man with a young wife. Dundu, Dundu, tarry a minute. Say the truth to me. Of what? Of my wife. What of her? Is she not beauteous? Yes. I see how you look at her. Oh? As young brother to me, happy for my happiness. Yes. So no. Yes. The next spike. Sighted well. Get close to it and line it. Yes. Bring your head closer to it, old man, and make sure. Midday and time for meal. Why do you stand with hammer poised over your head? What? The whistle has blown. Come, let us eat. Yes. Let us eat. Ah. Tired, old man? You are young. You would not know a sigh of happiness if you heard it. Oh? For I have just breathed one. Oh. Look how neatly my pride, my joy, my treasure has made for me my lunch. Grape leaves and chutney and coconuts, too. And you, Dundu, what... Am- what I bought in the village, the same thing each day, rice. Would you like a grape leaf? Dundu? Well... I hunger not. Take it. Well... I am an old man, and such richness as grape leaves and chutney does not agree with me. In truth, I would prefer rice, but uh, I would not tell my treasure of it, since she pleasures so in cooking for me. Well, then take my rice. Ah. Mm. Ah. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, what? Uh, <gasps> That was the young man falling over on his face because the old man's wife had put cobra venom in the chutney so the old man would die so she and the young man could pursue their love unencumbered. But the young man, having eaten the poisoned food, became deathly sick. He had eaten a dose that would have killed a less strong man, but he was the mighty Dondu and he did not die. A month later, he was well enough to tryst, and this he did. I dared not come to you, Don, do you know that? Yes. Lovely one, what do you do? Kneel to the gods for having preserved you for me. Add a prayer, then, of your husband. That he should die. For my love for you. For your love for me. Therefore, he must die. And soon. I will help. Together, then. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> But the precise opportunity never quite arose. Either there was someone near or within calling distance, or the old man didn't rise to the bait. There was one night when the bride put a crate, a small and deadly snake, into Sonu's bed on the very night that Sonu elected to sleep in the hammock outside. Something always seemed to go awry. I cannot stand him. He must die, or I shall. There is a festival next week for us at the railroad for the completed section. There he will die. I cannot stand him. He must die, or I will. And the days spun away, and a week, until there came a day of festival. And Mr. Graves of the railroad was concerned that everyone enjoy himself. And what do you do, sir? I am a spike holder, sir. Ah, uh, each member of our team is as important as the other. Yes, sir. And who is this lovely child by your side? My wife. Oh, charming, charming. Uh, uh, rise up, child. Oh, charming, charming, charming. A treasure, sir. You are blessed, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, enjoy yourself. Yes, sir. The BBC and I wants you to have a day you'll remember. Yes, sir. Uh, well, good day, then. Baggy, did you hear him? I heard. He noticed me. Yes. Perhaps. Perhaps what? This is the start of something, of position again, and wealth. 
as I was once wealthy. Yes. And perhaps again our own land and a house and bullocks and servants. Beloved. What? In your eyes, am I old? Oh, no. Then look at me. Yes. What do you see? Wisdom. A face which has pushed aside youthful folly to become lined with love and gentleness and knowledge. But now you... What of me? So youthful you are. Do you not sometimes miss the folly of youth? Not I. But it seems that you do. Then let us be foolish. How? I will flee from you and you will chase me. <laughs> yes, yes. Then catch me. Catch me, Sandu. <laughs> You remember the maiden's laughter, the maid of India scampering over the field, away from the crowd, and not running too fast so her husband can keep her in sight. <laughs> and the maiden runs toward her lover who is hiding in the tall grass with a sledgehammer right near that tree <laughs> where the old man caught his wife. <sighs> It is done. Now it is done. Hold me, hold me. As if... What? As if a great burden had been lifted up from me. Now you are widow. And I must grieve. Then I will be bride again. Yes. Now we will take this one to the place where I have dug his grave. And put this one in it and cover him with tall grass. The stride of you as you walk, Dandu. The suppleness. The grace. And you belong to me forever. Always, always and forever. Here. Well, the old man looks small there on the earth. I wish to see him no more. And I will cover him. Baggy. Yes, the thing we talked of. Yes. Do it now. Yes. has happened. Dead. 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 Who, who, who are you talking about? My husband. But what? Awful. What happened? Tell me. There. Down there at the river's edge. We were walking there where the bank was moist. He tore the river. And the bank slid away and he fell in. He fell into the river? Yes. Oh, crocodile. Do not say it. Child. Child. Son. Yes. I saw it. He slipped into the river and the current was strong and then the crocodiles and the river reddened. And... Oh, hush, child. Hush, hush. Now I am widow. Now I am widow. Now I am widow. There was no question about it. Now she was widow. And she observed all the self-denials that ritual called for. For six months she went about clad in coarse garments, her skin whitened with ashes, her hair unkempt. And when the allotted time was done, she washed the morning from her, and got out her best silk sari and the bells again, and went into the village and made it known that she was marriageable again. And it goes without saying that the first young man in line outside her father's hut was a hammer man named Dandu. And what will you give to me for my daughter? Peace of mind that your daughter is happy. And what will you give to her? My strength. If I refuse you, my daughter? There is no refusal. We have looked upon each other and found each other good. Baggy! Baggy! Come! Baggy, bow to your husband. Now, greet him. 
I have waited long, my lord. Command me. Uh, I'll help you down, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why the company bothered to send you all the way out here, Mr. Collins, but... It... BBC and I has a reason for everything, Mr. Graves. Now, let's look at it. Why you elected to build the spur right here. Why you have all these people building up a roadbed when you could run the road by way of mud ones. You stand here, sir, and see for yourself. Below, you see how the river curves? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, like an eel in the shape of an S. Ah. Mm. Therefore, it would take two bridges to complete. But the company chart had but one curve. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, that's why we have men in the field, sir. Dig in. Have them dig away. Sir! Uh, so then you'll give a proper report of me, sir, with Mr. Glamour? Sir! What's he want, that digger there waving at you? Uh, well, let's have a look, shall we? Now tell Mr. Glenda it's all been well thought out and the spur will be completed before the monsoon. Yes, my man, what is it you want? Look, sir, where I was digging to provide dirt for the roadbed. Well, I'll be dreadful. <laughs> Skeleton. Dreadful. No, look there. Dreadful. Here's a thing. Yes. Six toes. On each foot. Now, there's a thing. Now, since burning was the manner of disposal of corpses, a skeleton in the ground was something to ponder. A skeleton with six toes now. Somebody remembered that an old man named Sanu had had six toes and a young wife. So the young wife was questioned by the local authority, who happened to be Mr. Graves of the BBC and I. Child, skull crushed in like that. Hmm. He did not fall into the river, did he? I cannot lie. Yeah, uh, then don't. He did not fall into the river. No. Nah. He was murdered. He was murdered. Yeah. By a man of strength, according to the fracture. By a man of strength. Mm. Your present husband. Yes. Yes. Uh, you swear to this? Yes. Mm. You realize that he'll be hanged? Yes. And what of me? What of me, Syed? When your husband is hanged... Yes? I dare say you'll be right by his side. Her present husband was hanged. Then she was... In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Old Six Toes, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story... Jane Webb was heard as Boggy, and Herb Butterfield as Sonu. Featured in the cast were Jack Edwards, Van Wright, and Jack Crucian. Bob Lamont speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, we will concern ourselves with a band of gay conquistadores 
who decided to conquer the land of Peru in the year 1540. Because of what happened to them, it's listed in my files as Francisco Pizarro, his heart on a golden knife. Thank you. Good night. This Sunday night, Herbert Marshall stars as the Honorable Edmund Burke, British statesman and member of Parliament. Burke is the man who spoke so eloquently on behalf of American freedom during the Revolutionary War that his colleagues called him a traitor. Hear his story on CBS Radio Sunday night when the Radio Hall of Fame with Lionel Barrymore as your host turns the spotlight back to this stormy time. The Radio Hall of Fame on most of these same stations. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network.